So welcome everyone to this last panel of the day. Um, this one is on, so in the previous panel, we were hearing about a lot about the challenges and risks of accessing evidence and gathering evidence. And in this one, we're looking more at what you do with it when you've got it and what it is um, and what it can tell you. So um, the panel is case studies in evidence, archival, textual, visual, testimonial. Um, my name is Rachel Kerr. I'm a professor of war and society um, in the Department of War Studies at King's College, London, um, and also co-chair along with um, James Gow, the War Crimes Research Group here at King's. So I'm really pleased to introduce our two speakers. We have um, more time available to us in this panel. Unfortunately, um, our other speaker, Maria Gollick, couldn't join us, which is a uh, a real pity because I was I was looking forward to hearing about hearing her paper, um, which really interests sounds really interesting. But the upside is that we have longer to spend with um, Helen and David on their two very interesting papers as well. So I'm looking forward to to hearing from them. And um, and please feel free to take a little bit more than the sort of allotted 15 minutes if you need it. But um, it'd be good to finish up in enough time to allow some time for questions and discussion and particularly if we want to reflect a bit about um, the, the connections with other panels as well. Um, so if I can just introduce you both briefly um, and then we will go in the order that's on the programme. Um, so first up we have Dr Helen um, Mutier who is at the Université, I need to put my glasses on, Libre de Bosset, Bussel, sorry about my accent, which is terrible. Um, and we'll be talking to us about Gulf War memoirs, thoughts and representations of war through visual archives, the role, position and responsibility of the artist researcher. Um, and then we will hear from David Falk, um, who is a PhD candidate at Oil College at the University of Oxford, um, talking about memorialising the French resistance, resist, record, reassess, um, alias Alain. Um, so over to you, Helen, to kick us off. Have you got some slides to load up? Yeah. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here today uh, with you and uh, to have this great opportunity to, to share my work and my research about uh, the first Gulf War. So um, yeah, to introduce myself in a few words, I'm a French visual artist and researcher. I made a PhD um, at uh, between the, uh, the Free University of Brussels um, in the Faculty of Philosophy and Social Science, and, um, and uh, at the same time in the Academy of Fine Arts. So it was a, a PhD in uh, research and creation. So it was really interesting because it was uh, the opportunity for me to, to both um, have the experience of my artistic research and at the same time to, to develop uh, an, an academic research. So today um, I will start to, to present uh, in the first time the beginning of this research and the, ori the origin of my thought about the first Gulf War of 1991 and then in a second time I will uh, present some of my, um, some of my artistic work uh, based on the analysis of military archives from this conflict. So all this very long uh, research uh, started in 2009 when I discovered in my family course a lot of military archives uh, from the first Gulf War and composed of photographs, newspaper and uh, video. And these documents belongs to my father who was a soldier in the French army. And he was in the Gulf during the conflict and uh, his work was to prepare the mission of the French army. So about these archives, my interest was mainly focused on photograph and I was at the beginning extremely struck by the historical signification of these documents. And, uh, and at the same time, completely lost because I just uh, didn't, uh, I just cannot understand what I have under my eyes. It was really like a shock when I discovered this, uh, this photograph. 
And uh, I realized that it was really important uh, to decipher and analyze this photograph, but I was totally unable to do it. And, uh, and I really didn't understand what they represented. So it was something new for me. It was a, a new kind of images. Uh, I have never seen something like that before. So one of the important things to know about this project, it's that the link with this document, it uh, was at the beginning a link very intimate, very personal and very private. And at the same time, it was very far away from me because I had to understand it before incorporate the images in my own approach and my own artistic work. And at this moment, I asked to my father to help me to understand these photographs. And um, because it was um, one of the most important things for me to create this link between the origin of the archives and my own research. So it's also important for me to precise that this research, this research was not a thought and about the legal dimension of the military document and the classified defense, but it was a research about this archive status. So I've based all my work and all my research and my artistic work considering the military archives as a tool to propose a new approach to understand contemporary conflict through this approach between research and creation, and then in a second time inserted in a contemporary art context. So across this research, my intention was to find a way to document the world, and I consider that documenting the world through military archives was one of these ways. And the first question when I started this research, I asked to, my, to myself, what are these photographs? What type of documents do I have to, do, to deal with? Because originally these photographs are only aerial reconnaissance images taken by five top lanes to show and to testify that the missions carried out by the army during the conflict was down. So this is some pictures taken in a military context by military devices and then analyzed by soldiers and produced only for the military in order to provide a visual proof that the target has indeed been achieved. So for example, on this picture, we can see a soldier who is analyzing some pictures taken by drones. And we can also note that the pictures are in black and white are mostly in black and white. The size is mostly a square. And at the first glance, it's very difficult to understand the meaning without any expertise in the analysis of this type of images. So at this point, I've drawn a parallel between these photographic archives and my own artistic research, and I established two observations. First, I have to consider the war in connection with my own gaze, and it will be possible to propose another look on war and on conflict situation, and very far from the cliche traditionally associated with conflicts. And I described this look, it was a very, the mainly concept of my thesis research. It's a, it's a look, I, um, I called it a, a no-center look, like a desubjective look. And I have to find a way to go beyond the, this fascination and this aesthetic enjoyment I felt by discovering these photographs in order to propose a kind of visual alternative. And it is accordingly that this shift in the gaze may be understood. And then secondly, I noticed that the images produced during the Gulf War would not allow me to understand the conflict. Because this is it's new images in the, in the field of war representation were new and they provoked a rupture in the representation of the war. And one of the only thing we have retained from this conflict was precisely the lack of the representation. And for example, during my research, sometimes I ask for, from two people around me, give that I any memories of this conflict in whatever the memories and they often answer me, we didn't understand what was happening because we didn't see anything of this conflict. For example, to illustrate um, this word, we can see here, it's an infrared image of a laser guiding ground to her missile, published in the Figaro magazine, the 26th of January in 1991, 
And the caption of this picture is, this is a scalpel precision, but what was shot exactly? So this kind of words and expressions used to describe this conflict were essential, very, very present for my work and um, they were necessary because it steered me to question the way in which a conflict is given to see today in the contemporary conflict and the condition of production of the war images as well as in a certain time, this condition, the condition of the visibility. And thinking about the condition of visibility, it's also a challenge for the new form of visual narrative, which results from the production of these images at the crossroad of an artistic and a scientific knowledge. So this, dialectic, this dialectical relationship between research and creation proves that the implication of these new methodologies is multiple today. The collection of scientific data by artists as well as the new ways of seeking generated by this hybridization, a part of position that promotes encounter between art, humanities, social, or political sciences. And it was an important point during my all my thesis research because I realized that um, with my colleague in political sciences in international relations, we have sometimes a lot of academic reference in, uh, in common. So I will now present uh, three projects I have developed with these military archives. So you can see a view of my uh, thesis exhibition. Uh, it was at the end of uh, uh, the, the year 2020. And uh, I thought and conceived it, uh, this exhibition at the culmination of my research about the, the archives of the Gulf War. And thus it brings together all the projects I had carried out between 2010 and 2019 around this document. So I really worked like a big investigation and sometimes very close to a journalistic approach. And it led me to process and use these archives as a real tool of research. And I observe this image a lot. And sometimes for a very long time, I manipulated them, I reproduced them, I put them aside and came back to them several months or sometimes several years later because it was a, a research I conducted for more than 10 years. And little by little, uh, a formal rigor rigor appeared like an obviousness and I decided to only work with a square size to keep the first version format of the archives. So here you can see uh, in the showcase some, uh, some of these archives uh, I was work with. So for this project uh, entitled Before and After, I worked uh, and implemented particular military observation procedures such as the before and after one which make it possible to observe uh, the damage caused on the same place, but at two different time on specific territories, which was bombed. So for example, here, I reused exactly the same process using Google Earth software and images produced in Google Earth. So from five geographic coordinates of locations that were bombed during the Gulf War, one in Iraq and four in Kuwait, I collect and I took all the images that the software has on this five location and use it to do an, a big installation of all this archive produced by uh, satellites of Google. Here we can see a, a detail of the installation. So by establishing this precise and regular process, I wanted to situate and remain my work in the continuity of the standardization was the industrial operating processes. So the image is here inserted in a serial and continuous mode of production. And the series can continue and evolve all the time on and according to the technologies advances of Google Earth and the new images which are produced by the satellites. So here I stopped the, the project in uh, 2016, but I could continue the series. So the second project I would like to present to you, it's a project called Entitled ETA. And it's a project composed of a series of 26 photographs 
that I produced on spectroscopic glass plate. But at this time, I was uh, when I, I developed this project, I was working. Um, it was like a, a collaboration during my PhD with the Royal Observatory of uh, of Belgium. So I have access to uh, uh, some kind of particular documents and material to work. And uh, for example, here, the spectroscopic glass plates are um, uh, specific plates originally used to photograph the sky. So I made pictures transferred of my personal archives on these blank glass plates, uh, adapting the photographic development process by accomplishing everything by hand and using emulsions applied on the glass. So crossing the photography and the glass and mix it together it's like combines the influence of astronomy science and war perceptions to create a link between the appearance of a new images and its own disappearance at the same time. And so um, after um, all this long project and especially after my uh, thesis, I, I thought that uh, my work was done with the uh, Gulf War. I thought that it was behind me and uh, that uh, I, I cannot do anything else uh, about this conflict. But finally, one year ago, uh, I decided to start a new work uh, about this subject, um, but a new field work by going in the Gulf uh, to produce my own pictures as a photographer and to work with uh, this time with public archives and not with personal archives. So I have the opportunity to go in Saudi Arabia in the March and April of this year. Uh, in the context of an artistic residency program in, uh, in Jeddah. So this new project, so I started this year, um, it's entitled Here and There. So I uh, developed, uh, I started to develop the project during the, the art residency uh, called the Al Balad Residency Program. Um, so it's a new long-term project. I would like to develop it for two or three years. And it's a project that combines the photographic approach and the production of a documentary of creation in the West and in the Gulf region between France, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq to cross the West with one of the this my research is based on the history of the 1991 conflict, but follows the temporal and geographical unfolding of the facts to propose to take a sociological look at the war in the light of the technologies traditionally used in the military field. So, as you can see on the slide, this is um, some example of photographs I took during the residency. So chosen to produce my photograph by using the black and white infrared technology because it was a photographic technical who was who was originally um, using by the army and uh, it was especially used by the army during the first world war to improve aerial shot on glass plates for making some landscape mappings so for example here you can see the red sea um, just uh, in the area of the city of Jeddah. And here it's, um, it's a, a, a specific place, uh, it's a specific area in the city of Jeddah and uh, we call it Haliskan building. And uh, what was very, uh, the thing, it was very interesting for me, it's uh, that it's an area, it's a place where there is a 32 buildings and it was a place where some refugees were slept during the war. So um, during this, uh, uh, the intention of the uh, of the of this project is to go to uh, to specific places um, uh, that play a, a, a specific role uh, during this conflict. So. Um, during my six week in Saudi Arabia, I went uh, so I stay in Jeddah, and uh, I um, I also went to uh, so you have this uh, pictures of uh, a normal picture of the Aliskan building, and then this is a pictures in infrared photography, and I also uh, went to Yombu to uh, Yombu Harbor because uh, a part of the French army came in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, in 19 by the harbor of Yombu. 
and uh, so I was in the area to take uh, to take uh, to take my pictures and to start also the scouting for my documentary. So here there is a there is a, this is a part of Yombu and this uh, are some uh, screenshots for um, uh, of uh, video rush um, uh, for the documentary um, I, I am currently develop and. Uh, on this uh, last slide, uh, you can see an archives of the French army uh, taken in, uh, in 90 when the French army uh, arrived uh, in, uh, at Yambu in the, in the harbor of Yambu. And the soldiers stay there for a few days before going in the desert uh, to join some uh, strategic and tactical places in the desert. So, for example, in the military city of King Khalid are close to the border with uh, Iraq and uh, Kuwait. So this project is still in, uh, in progress. This is really, really, really the, the beginning. But, uh, but the next step is to go back to uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and to continue uh, later in uh, Kuwait and Iraq to uh, once and uh, for all finish uh, this research and this documentation uh, about this conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. That's absolutely fascinating and, and really great to see some of the work that you've been producing. Um, I think we're going now from images to text um, and memoir. Uh, so, David, over to you to, to present yours. I think you have a PowerPoint as well, don't you? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Um, so I'll just get that set up. Uh, Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so can everybody see that? Yeah, do you want to just hit the slideshow button so that it shows us? Um, yeah, fab, that's it. Okay, good. All right, well, thank, thank you very much. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about a man whose name is Daniel Cordier, and I've entitled this, uh, this presentation, Resist, Record, Reassess, alias Alan. <clears throat> okay, so this is an introduction that was given by um, a man who was known as Alan Savary. Uh, he was in Francois Mitterrand's government, and I'll just read it out for you. He arrived in England on the 25th of June, 1940, guiding 14 volunteers. In July, 1942, he was parachuted into France. He created and led Jean Moulin's secretariat in Lyon and in Paris until March, 1944. He holds Moulin's archives, in the archives of the BCRA, he selected the documents for the White Book on the BCRA, which he wrote in collaboration with Stefan and Vicia Hessel. In the past five years, you have prepared a work on Jean Moulin's mission. My dear companion, I give you the floor. So this concise introduction to Daniel Cordier was given by Alan Savary, the education minister in Francois Mitterrand's government, and also a former resistor and the speech was made at the Sorbonne on the 9th of June, 1983. This event sought to showcase the growing historiography of French resistance during the Second World War. Having arrived in England on the 25th of June, 1940, Cordier heard that Charles de Gaulle had spoken on the BBC airwaves. De Gaulle's call of the 18th of June was an appeal for like-minded French people to rally to his side. After joining the Free French Forces, Cordier volunteered for Colonel, Colonel Passy's second bureau, which served as the Free French Information and Information Services. In France, Cordier was seconded to Jean Moulin, the former prefect of Eure et Loire, and since January of 1942, he had been de Gaulle's political representative in the country. As Savary had underlined, Cordier led the Secretariat, which was Moulin's administrative office. 
Over the following year, Cordier handled over 300 million francs, largely of which were largely destined for the movements Combat, Liberation Sud, and Franc Tireur. Those were groups within the French resistance. Following Jean Moulin's arrest in Calure on the 21st of June, 1943, Cordier remained in Paris to organize the administration for his successor, Claude bouchinet Cyril. However, the arrest of Cyril's new team had forced Cordier to uh, leave France for, uh, for Spain, where he was interned at the Miranda camp on the 8th of uh, April, 1944. With Paris liberated, alongside Stéphane and Vicia Hessel, the trio did indeed write the White Book of the BCRA, which was a history of the, uh, the organization's operations and their organization. Afterwards, Cordier turned towards the art world, having become passionate about modern art through his conversations with Moulin. Cordier opened uh, a gallery in Paris in 1958 and subsequently went on to open two more in Frankfurt and in New York. Nonetheless, the growing commercialization of the global art market led Cordier to turn his back on the industry in the early 1960s. In 1977, however, Cordier was invited to appear on a television program where he was to talk about the life of Jean Moulin. Heated debate ensued with Henri Frenet, who was the leader of one of the resistance groups, Combat, uh, and they were the largest of the French resistance movement. And, uh, and um, Frenet was uh, defending the recently published criticism. However, Cordier announced the accusations that Frenet was making very weakly, and he relied on constant appeals to previously unseen documents that he held in his possession. So in order to correct this, uh, this weakness, he uh, had to become a historian once again. Visiting archives, Cordier and his team of researchers produced two volumes on Moulin's life before the war and a synthesis of his uh, wartime missions. Cordier received a lot of acclaim for his biography of Moulin, but it was his war memoirs that were written in the style of a diary, where it, which allowed him mostly to reflect upon his own life story. He had been a participant, he'd become a historian, and he was now offered, offered the chance to give multiple reappraisals of his own wartime service. His book, Alias Caracalla, was turned into a 2013 telefilm, and his memoirs from the period 1943 to 1946 were posthumously published last year in 2021. Reflecting upon his, new, his wartime role, uh, few in France were in a position to say that they had played a leading part in French resistance activity. But even fewer can have been said to have reanalyzed the historical documents that they themselves had written. Okay, so returning to Cordier's time in the resistance, his mission to, into France began on the 26th of July, 1942. Originally, he had been <coughs> expected to serve as the wireless transmissions officer for the Bureau d'Information et de Presse BIP, the uh, Bureau of Information and the Press. However, he was instead introduced to Jean Moulin. The next day, Moulin created his secretariat, putting Cordier at its head. The mission's objectives were to unite the three Southern movements that I referred to earlier, uh, by convincing them of general support, both militarily and monetarily. Moulin intended to do this by creating a common administrative framework, wherein the missions, uh, the movements uh, required, um, but did not have the financial and organisational means to implement, which they required, but they didn't have the financial and organisational means to implement. Cordier began his secretarial tasks by recruiting for the mission Rex. Rex was the code name for Moulin's mission. His first recruit was an Alsatian refugee called Lord Diebold, and who served as the mission's typist. Cordier's other tasks included encrypting and decrypting messages that were destined for London, for keeping meetings with other groups, holding on to the mission's money, and also distributing it via the use of uh, clandestine liaisons. 
Um, however, in response to the growing imperative that was coming from de, Gaulle, uh, de Gaulle's forces over in Algiers um, in order to form a union between those diverse groups in France, Moulin travelled to Paris with more and more regularity. With the mission of establishing the National Resistance Council approaching its fruition at the end of 1943, where all of the major groups in the southern zone coalesced alongside some of the political parties from the northern zone, Cordier was himself sent up to the capital in order to create another secretariat. However, Moulin was arrested in June at the house that I'm, I've got showing on the PowerPoint. It's uh, in one of the outskirts of Lyon, Calduir. Um, and this heralded a period of great instability for Cordier, unsurprisingly, and he fled at that point to Spain. He arrived back in Britain and was therefore reintegrated into the Gaullist secret services, the BCRA, in 19, May of 1944. Okay, now on to the second part of the uh, talk, where, which I've called Record, before the Cordier Phenomenon. The Cordier Phenomenon is Julian Jackson's of Q uh, Queen Mary University of London. It's his term to reflect Cordier's role as a, and I quote, historical actor, a historian, and a witness. He builds on Laurent Duzou, from a historian from Lyon, and what he referred to as the, and I quote, Cordier moment that was published the previous year, and which argues that the 1983 conference that Cordier held at the Sorbonne and said that it was a pivotal moment for the historiography of resistance in France. Before Cordier, many texts produced on the resistance had relied on uh, interviews, oral history interviews with participants. However, due to the unrivaled access to written sources that Cordier held, he, uh, he attempted to write the history of Moulin's life principally from the use of this archival evidence. As one of Cordier's uh, first attempts at writing history, it is important to look a bit more into the, um, the writing of the Livre Blanc. That, that is what I believe. Um, so in the uh, spirit of post-liberation Paris, the language employed in the, the White Book is uh, highly laudatory of the efforts of resistance forces, both inside and outside of France. For instance, there, is, there are many mentions of the words patriots, patriotes, and on seven occasions, and the suggestion that the Cross of Lorraine, that you've been able to see behind in the PowerPoint, um, and that the Cross of Lorraine is a symbol of French unity. There's also a tendency to show the author's proximity to the efforts in France. <clears throat> so what I've just put up here is some word clouds that show uh, the Livre Blanc, all of the, the text that went into the Livre Blanc, I've put it into, into word clouds cloud format uh, using those words that are over five characters in length and then I've put it against a uh, another word cloud that was created from using American sources but also talking about resistance activity. So there is a tendency for the authors of Livre Blanc to show their proximity to the uh, underground efforts that were taking place in France. Their tone is quite unlike those that were adopted in the official histories which favour the separation of authors from the, event, uh, from the events in question. This tendency has uh, been amplified when the Livre Blanc is compared to the document on the organisation of activities of French resistance units, which were undertaken by the historical section of ETOUSA, e -O -U -S -A, the, uh, the US Army. Throughout the Livre Blanc, the British are recognised as having helped French resistance efforts, but they also, it's made clear that they also remained reticent uh, when giving their full support to General de Gaulle. And this has been clarified by um, other documents that were found in the British, British National Archives. Um, what Jackson refers to as Cordier's feticide fetishization of documents was a direct consequence, I believe, of having written the Livre Blanc. Cordier admitted that many of the documents that he had held himself 
belonged in the BCRA's archives. However, his successor in the post, uh, when back in 1944, when he decided to um, turn his back on the uh, on the military and go into private life, so his successor Guy de Broglie had shut up a lot of these uh, documents into boxes and sent them to Cordier's personal home after he had left his uh, job with the services. Hence, why Cordier had his own separate archives relating to the BCRA. With those documents, he was even, even able to bargain with them, promising Pierre César, the, uh, the then head of the modern history at the Archive National, that he would return them and quid pro quo, Cordier would receive privileged access to other files concerning Moulin that were kept within the, uh, the Archive National. So this all goes to show the unique nature of the work that was able to be done by Cordier would the Cordier phenomenon have existed had it not been for the Livre Blanc? That was what I was asking myself. So now for the third part, which I've called reassess among the few. So arguably it may well have done. Cordier remained an important secondary figure in the panoply of resistance leaders in wartime France. His own story, which only appeared a few times in, in his own works on when he was writing about Jean Moulin, was uh, viewed as being sufficiently important so as to lead one of the, the French uh, historians on the resistance, Jean-Pierre Azema, to suggest that Cordier should write his own memoirs, which ultimately led to our alias Caracalla. And that marked a further transformation in Cordier's cultural role, where he began as a protagonist before becoming a historian and then capping it off by writing his own memoirs. So in his final years, Cordier saw his role as changing from defending Moulin's honour, as he previously had done against uh, Henri Frenet in that 1977 uh, tele television appearance. Um, and he saw it turning towards keeping alive the memory of those who had resisted uh, against the Nazi occupation. So throughout the Livre Blanc, its authors referred to la resistance, the resistance. This usage of the capitalization on the R and uh, the singular form of the noun demonstrate that the, author, the author's thoughts on the subject. Effectively, it semantically disregards other resistance efforts that were taking place uh, in France but outside of the Gaullist organizational framework, including those that were run by, uh, that were known as the Buckmaster missions. Those were missions that were run purely by the British Secret Services, the SOE, um, as opposed to those that were taking place in conjunction with the BCRA, and those were being led by the Free French as well as SOE. Um, however, by the time of writing of Alias Caracalla, so in 2009, Cordier had, by his own admission, begun to recognise the plurality of uh, resistance activities. The writing style of Valius Caracalla is, as I've said earlier, highly, highly different to the approach that he took uh, on his, for his biography of Jean Moulin. As these had been re received widespread praise, um, that helped to provide legitimacy for Cordier's own later memoirs. And instead, Cordier's story unwinds through the form of a daily journal with a lot of direct dialogue in, within it. However, for Cordier, uh, the material culture and things that he kept, um, such as his pay book, for instance, as you can see on the screen, it un all of this underlined ver veracity of his own literary story. So the interviews that I conducted with Mr. Cordier um, were, aim, were intended to record his own memories about the financing in particular of French resistance, as he was such a fundamental part in the, in the expedition. And secondly, to find out more about his own everyday experience in occupied France. The only previous records on resistance financing were written uh, by the main participants in London, people like uh, Pierre Denis, the head of the Free French Financial Services, or those who were in post during the Algerian period, so after 1943 when de Gaulle had left London and taken up, uh, uh, taken up the, his place at, in Algiers, so people like André Postalvine, or 
it was uh, it came from the organization of financing from inside france in 1944 so those who uh, had also been uh, dispatched but at a later point than moulin and cordier had so people like francois bloc lene so at times cordier spoke very poignantly most notably about his post-war relationship with suzette or suzanne olivier where he explained that he bitterly regretted the pain that he would that he caused her when he told them uh, he told her and some of the other members of his of his secretariat that he would no longer see them after the war that he was trying to make a clean break with everything that had come before the war Cordier's hostile feelings towards Petain and the Nazis had uh, crystallized into a continued ap ap antipathy. And relating to de Gaulle, Cordier clearly respected his wartime leader, but in the years after the war, their uh, paths had uh, diverged politically, and Cordier had been a founding member of what was known as the Club Jean Moulin, so alongside Stefan Hessel, with whom he'd written the uh, Livre Blanc, Cordier and another friend set up a, a group where, um, uh, th so there was a movement of resistance born out of a refusal of a certain idea of the Republic. They were, they were contestatory, they did not like what uh, de Gaulle represented and were, worri were worried that by exploiting rebellion in Algeria, that de Gaulle was going to lead France towards fascism. So he clearly had gone from being a very, very fervent supporter of de Gaulle to in the post-war years being one of his most fervent opponents. Okay, so <clears throat> in conclusion, um, Cordier was one of the first members of the French external resistance coming over to London in June 1940. He was sent back into France to serve as a wireless operator before being seconded to Jean Moulin um, to serve as his secretary at serve as his secretary for the mission. Cordier's financial work was vital for the survival of French resistance efforts during the difficult period of 1942 and 1943. Towards the end of the war and following his escape from France, Cordier co-authored <clears throat> the official history of the BCRA, Bureau Central de Renseignement et d'Action. After a brief career in the art trade, he began to write uh, his former boss's biography. And, but later in life, having previously relied on written reports and data to perform his work, Cordier radically altered his approach for his own biography. Uh, Jackson's um, Cordier phenomenon, or reflecting on Daniel Cordier as a protagonist, historian, and memorialist, all stems from Cordier's participation in the writing of the Livre Blanc and the financial aspects of his wartime work. So thank you very much for listening, everybody. Thank you very much, David. Um, thank you. That's really interesting, very detailed account of, of the sort of um, processes of, of writing memoirs and writing history in the life of, of this one person. Um, I just wonder why we gather in a couple of questions. I was just going to draw a couple of, um, sort of more general questions out from both that arise for me from both of your, um, your both your papers. The panel just at the beginning we sort of went from challenges and risks of getting to the evidence and gathering the evidence to this question of what we do with it and what what is done with it. Um, and I think it's this this issue around um, purpose, the purpose of of what you're doing with it and the audience for it um, that is really interesting and sort of ties together perhaps your, your two papers. Um, so you're talking about very different formats um, of evidence and different uses of it, um, but sort of images and, and text, if you like, and archives and how, how that um, is drawn out. But both, um, both of you are talking about interpretation and both using kind of talking about use of interpretive tools. So whether interpreting um, material to, to write histories or to write memoirs or interpreting it to create artwork. Um, and so you're sort of taking the, if you like, raw data um, and, and then doing something with it. Um, so this sort of takes us back to this question of what the evidence is for. And I think, you know, in this sense, maybe we make a distinction between the different types of evidence and different purposes and the sort of line between historical so historical evidence, um, using evidence to, to indicate something or to support something, and using evidence in a legal 
context to prove something. I think those, those things are quite different and that sort of relates back to the earlier discussions about um, testimony um, and historical narrative. Um, but I wonder in this case, what are, um, what are these types of evidence being used to do? What are they doing? First of all, what can they do? Um, what can memoirs do? Um, what can artwork do that other forms of evidence might not be able to? You know, is there something sort of different in, in its ability to, to connect um, and the stories that it can tell? Um, Helene raised a question um, in her paper of, of truce, um, and I think that's a really interesting one to ponder about what kind of truth and whose truth um, is found using evidence and certainly in interpreting evidence. Um, and the differences between establishing, using evidence to establish facts, using evidence to, to take meaning. Um, and I think in both cases, um, the interpretation of the evidence and the sort of reworking of it and rewriting it um, go to raise some questions about you know, where, where the tensions are and what the, where the, as Helen calls it, a confrontation between those two things. Um, and my question really for both of you is, can evidence then provide both are these are both of your accounts the the art um yeah whether you produce helen helen and uh, and, the, and the memoirs an accounting of facts or um are they a um an accounting of meaning or is it is it both um and then also to think about the audience for both of those things i think in both of your papers the audience was quite important as to who who it is that is being affected by either the, um, the memoirs, the biographies and the interpretations of history um, or by the artwork. Um, so um, David, in your case, I had a particular question about the purpose um, for which Cordier is writing. So you talk about the encounter that he had that made him go back and have another look, sort of re, re examine the archives and, and, um, and and represent history, and then it becomes increasingly his his story rather than Mulan's story. And I wonder, in that sense, whether you have any indication of what you know beyond that kind of um, initial defence. What is it that motivates that work, and what audience is is he seeking to reach in doing that? Um, and then, Helen. Um, Thanks again for, for showing us a bit of your work. And I think you know, one of the things that, that comes across is the, you know, the, the compelling nature of the images that you present, the artwork that you present, that it makes you want to look at it and engage with it. And I wonder how, you know, my question is how important is that? How important is the aesthetics? Um, and when you're processing, you're processing the images, so you're taking um, images which we use for one purpose and you're turning them into something that you want people to look at and engage in in a different way. So do they have to be, in a sense, beautiful? Do they have to be compelling in that way? Um, was that part of your, um, part of the considerations in, in when you were processing the images? And I wonder too, um, James Gow mentioned an artist that, that we worked with before, Vladimir Miladinovich, who, who redraws documents. And I was thinking in your work, in your reprocessing of images, whether there's a process there of your own, your own sort of reckoning with the, the evidence and thinking about how, not just how you want to present it aesthetically, but what it, what it means and drawing out the meaning from it in the, in the sort of act of processing. Um, and then finally, I, I was sort of intrigued by this, this idea of purpose again, what the purpose of the images were, and then particularly when you look at the, the sort of target sites, those original, images were for a very different purpose to the one that you'll be producing them for. Um, so the evidence, it was evidence of, it could be taken as evidence of one thing, but then you're using it, or it becomes evidence of something else. And I wondered if you could speak a bit to what, um, what you're trying to evidence, like what is it that it becomes evidence of when you present it in this way? Um, so, what's your purpose as an artist um, in working with the material and presenting it? And what are you seeking the evidence, what are you seeking to uncover with this, with this evidence? Um, 
So I'll leave it there and perhaps turn it back to, to both of you. And then I can see that we've got two hands up um, already from, from Mike and Joe. So um, should I give you, a, you two a chance to comment first and then we'll go back and get Joe and Mike's comments and any others that come in. That's all right. Um, so do you want to go in the order, Helen first and then David? Um, thank you, thank you for uh, your remark, Rachel. So I will uh, try to um, to make uh, the perfect uh, answer with all the the information I collect uh, with your uh, questions. Um, but um, you ask for uh, what are the uh, what kind of uh, memories do this uh, these images? What kind of uh, um, for me, it was at the beginning. It was uh, something uh, really, really personal, and uh, it was uh, important for me um, before uh, engage um, an academic research and an artistic research to understand these documents and to uh, to keep this link with my family um, uh, because uh, because this. Uh, it's 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 like a family heritage. Uh, these documents and. Um, and so uh, during all my research, the turning point of, uh, of my work uh, was to, um, uh, um, through this, uh, this concept of, um, 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 of, uh, of the, the shift of the gaze, uh, it was to, as an artist, to, to find my place face to this document and face to these images. It was to find a position um and uh, and uh, even if i um reused uh, some uh, specific way to uh, specific processes um as the same as the military process to work um i need at the, at the end of uh, of my um, of my uh, thesis to as you see under the view of my exhibition to have a, a different universe uh, to propose another look uh, on these images and uh, because my interest was uh, on the way on uh, how all these images um, were produced on the field and during this conflict uh, in the second time um, uh, if they are uh, published uh, or if anything else um, has access, had access at this moment uh, to these documents. And in a third time, um, how can I reuse it uh, in another context? And uh, my question was, uh, if the information um, descri which described these pictures uh, if I uh, work on it, uh, if the signification of this document will be the same, uh, if they, if I decided to show them in a different context, and um, and so face to the audience or face to the public, I consider that um, anyone can have his own look. Uh, on this conflict specifically. Um, you can create um, your own memories on this war. You can imagine what you want. Uh, and, uh, and this was uh, the point, uh, the most important thing for me um, by creating uh, um, um, an artistic work with this document and with, with these archives to finally, um, at the end, separate my own history and my own heritage to think about uh, public reflection and a public thought about uh, the world perception and how we can uh, today, um, how we can have uh, another look on, uh, on war conflict and far from uh, what we see uh, all the day in a newspaper or uh, in the media and uh, on television and uh, internet. So uh, and and the the temporality too when you have in a, in, a, in the context of an exhibition in your, or in a museum the temporality there is something most um, I said a visual narrative and there is a narration there is something there is a story uh, who is written at the same time that the public and the, the audience dis discovered the work 
and um, so it's important that, that to have this this new temporality uh, phase two conflicts. Thank you, Glenn. That's really interesting about temporality, isn't it? Because it's such a the Gulf War was sort of the first really I don't know if it's the first, but the really visual war that we you know took place on television every night, and then and so those images are still all around if we want to get them, but having them your sort of curation of them and reproduction of them existing in a certain time and space creates a different form of engagement so yeah thank you um david i turn to you mm, yeah um so uh well i'll start from the final question um so what was the purpose for cordier for writing his works well i mean there, there were a number of them the the BCRA, the Livre Blanc, uh, that was primarily written as an official history for the um, for the benefit of the provisional government of the French Republic. So when they'd come back in after the occupation had finished, um, they wanted to put down on paper what the, the the clandestine work that they had been doing and exactly putting it into into paper so that. Um, people would be able to go and see afterwards. And it was quite a prescient thing to do because the following year, um, so we're talking 1946 now, there was a, um, the, the, the newspapers, I think it was Le Monde published a story whereby um, the head of the BCRA, Colonel Passy was accused of having um, misused some of the funds that were being, give, being sent over from London into France. Um, and there were, there were accusations that that was being kept in a form of a slush fund to be able to be used politically after the war um, to influence uh, France as the Gaullists would have wanted. That was the accusation. Um, the, the Livre Blanc was in part a, a, a bit of a means of responding to those accusations that had been made by Le Monde. But at the same time, it was also to put down exactly what had been done from the perspective of the BCRA and what had been done by the resistance in France. So that had a very clear objective as to why, why that piece of work was being written. Um, for Cordier's own work, when he did the, the biography of Jean Moulin, um, well, that was primarily in response to that uh, television programme that I was referring to in 1977, um, whereby Henri Frenet, the leader of combat, had previously written a book wherein he accused uh, Jean Moulin of being a crypto-communist so that he was uh, effectively supporting the communists to a far greater degree than any of the other French movements. Um, so when those accusations were brought up uh, during this particular TV appearance, Cordier wanted to be able to respond and say, no, Moulin wasn't a, a communist. I saw all of what was going on. Look, I've got these pieces of paper that he had had for 30 or 40 years at that point, but nobody had seen them. So his reason for writing the biography of Moulin was in a, as a means of refuting what Frenet had said, that Cordier wasn't a crypto-communist. And look, yet again, here is what the BCRA did during the war, and here is what Moulin did during the war. So that his second work also had quite a... a, a, a there, was, there was a reasoning behind the writing of it. His third book and fourth book, uh, Alias Caracalla and um, uh, Victoire en Pleurant, were his attempts at putting down his story the way that he wanted it said to recount the details of his life and uh, giving it from his perspective. So that was a more of a personal book, the, the biography, as, hence why I think he felt uh happy with changing the the way that he had previously worked which was more akin to a historian by going into more of a memorialist um putting on his memorialist hat if you want um so th those were the purposes for writing the books they each had a specific purpose um but his final books were mostly to get over to new generations exactly what had been the resistance because they what well, people of anyone younger than about 80 or 90 hadn't experienced the war, didn't know what was really happening. There were plenty of other accounts. He wants to add his to his account to, uh, to, to the corpus of documents. Um, 
Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think about some of the other pieces. Mike that just we're... bring in. Maybe I'll mm. just bring in um, Joe and Mike um, here. Um, my, my question is almost a follow up, David, yeah. on what you, you, you were just saying, uh, uh, because it, it strikes me that I mean, I'm sure you know this and it's 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 part of your work. So, <laughs> but I mean, it's 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 this is the arc of the story it also uh, follows the arc of the reassessment of, of Vichy. Right. I mean, it's the Paxson uh, revolution. Uh, uh, so, you know, how, mu how much is, is this sort of reassessment and, and what Courtier is doing in the Courtier moment is part of the sort of. Uh, 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 um, reassessment and transformation about uh, Vichy. Hmm. Yeah, um, so the arc of reassessment, basically, um, we're, we're going to, well, to, to put it briefly, the de Gaullists um, insisted that France was liberated by itself, that nobody else helped particularly other than, oh, yes, we were allowed to uh, set up set up in the UK. We did have a bit of help from the Americans, but it was the French who liberated themselves. That, that was the beginning of the arc. Paxton uh, reassessed by uh, going and looking at the Vichy archives and ascertaining that there weren't quite as many resistors as, uh, as had been previously said, that France wasn't uh, 90% resistors against 10% collaborators. Paxton brought that in. Cordier, the Cordier moment, the 1983 conference, yeah, that, that does inscribe itself into the Paxton reappraisal. Um, the reason that they were trying to organise the conference was as a means of effectively giving Cordier the opportunity to present his, his work in an academic setting whereby he could be interrogated by historians as well as other resistors and uh, in front of a public so that people could uh, see and hear about some of these documents that Cordier had said a few years previously that he had got in his possession and it was a means of transmitting that to the public prior to the uh, publication of the, the biography of Mulan, which came out a few years later, I think about five years later. So yeah, it, it totally does uh, fit in with the, the arc of reassessment. Um, the, the, the meeting in Paris was um, one of, one of the, the fundamental steps in the, the reappraisal that had been kicked off by um, Robert Paxton, but also the the documentary of uh, the sorrow and the pity uh, uh, by more Ulls, Ulls, I think was the the director's name. Um, but yeah, it certainly inscribed itself into that. And then I think the alias Caracalla and the his his own biography was his way his own um, his own writings were a way of expressing himself and his perspective on what uh on the war as he saw it that he hadn't been able to uh, previously express yep thank you thanks david mike hey thanks um you know great great presentations both i i, I guess my, my question is um primarily for for helen um and uh just the way to focus it is is a comment that you made rachel about the you know the purpose of the images and the purposes of the of the of the, of the exhibit and I'm just I'm thinking about the purpose of the collection, that piece in between, right? Um, Helen, your your father's collection, your family uh, heritage. Um, I guess what comes to mind is what what archivists refer to as respect de fond, right? The importance of preserving a collection as it was as a collection. So your father's intent in creating that collection, and having to take that and then reorganize it or repurpose it for purposes of creating an exhibit. And I'm just wondering. I, I'm curious how that works when it's a family collection. Uh, I know how it works in an institutional setting, um, and, and there has to be, you know, if there's an exhibit created, it needs to be then returned to its original state, and and you know the you know the collection is only a collection if it's preserved in its original format, which provides insight into, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just, I'm just wondering how important that was to you, if it's a factor at all. Um, if you've had to basically take the correction, uh, the collection, reorganize it, change it into an exhibit, what then happens after? Is it a permanent exhibit? Does it get returned into its original state um, in boxes or what have you? I'm just curious about your process and your thinking and, and priorities when it when it comes to that, especially because it's a it's it's privately owned, it's a family collection, so you can do what you want with it, and and that in a sense that still preserves that. Um, but I guess 
then then there's a disconnect between what your father intended with the collection and then what you would do with it as a family. Sorry, some of that feels like maybe asking very personal questions. Um, but I'm just I'm very curious. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, it is a very personal question. <laughs> and um, uh, in fact, uh, during uh, all the, the presentation, uh, um, uh, during all the, the exhibition I have made uh, to present my work about the Third Gulf War, I've never um, uh, make any presentation um, with uh, um, well, when when you when you saw uh, earlier uh, on the slide the showcase with uh, archives, uh, I always present the documents um, as archives. For me, they are, they are, uh, these documents are not um, um, anything else. They are archives, and uh, so that uh, and this this was the the most important important things for me. Uh, it, was um, at the same time, yes, a military document, but it was also um, an archives. And uh, it was so a reflection between these two aspects of the documents. And um, so uh, on my process, I um, because there is a, a, a lot of photographs, uh, really a lot. And um, so I've seen everything and uh, I've chose um, the most important uh, photographs for me, as for example, for my project before and after, I only I've only choose some um, photograph with uh, geographical coordinates to uh, to to have the exact position of uh, of um, of, the, of the places bombed during the war uh, between Iraq and uh, Kuwait. And uh, so I, I take the picture with me. I work with the picture, and then when my my uh, like my investigation, because it was a kind of investigation, is finished, I um, I, I I put the document on the box, and uh, and that's all. That uh, and, and today I consider that uh, my work um, with this family documents is finished. So that's why I explained that my uh, the new project I am um, developing now in um, in the Gulf region uh, it, it will be a, a project with only public archives because I have done with uh, with the personal one. Thank you, thanks, Helen. Um, I think as there weren't any other questions, we will wrap up there um, with five minutes to spare and hand back over to Mike and. Joe, who are going to wrap up the day, I think. So it just remains to say thank you very much once again, Helen and, and David, um, for your presentations. Um, and over to you, Mike, I think. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. And thanks, um, David and Helen. Um, I think throats are dry and brains are maybe a bit dry at the end of the day. Um, so I won't I won't drag this too much probably because I'll start you know slurping my own words uh, and reaching for the water bottle too often. Uh, just just to extend sincere thanks to everybody. Um, this this has been sort of in Joe's and, and Mike's brains for you know the better part of a year, and it's been really validating uh, to to have this happen. And and we're grateful to all of you for showing up and presenting such interesting papers right across the board and for such stimulating discussions. Um, so my personal thanks to all of you and thanks to the uh, discussants uh, for helping to corral a, a lot of this. Um, and uh, to Joe in particular, uh, to, I guess to return the thanks uh, for, for initially agreeing to set up this weird creature we call the Conflict Records Unit within the Sir Michael Howard Center um, and, and to indulge me the space to you know, start carving out these, um, these um, speaker events and in particular this first conference um, you know, we, we, we played with whether we would make it uh, on site, online, hybrid, uh, or what. And of course, there are all sorts of extenuating factors that come into that, like COVID and travel and availability of people. I, I ended up, um, as we were starting to talk about this, uh, taking a position with the UN, which, you know, occupies my, my uh, headspace and my physical location, uh, you know, on a, on a Pretty, pretty intensive sort of basis. And so um, this, this media and this approach that we took and that, that Joe, that really, you know, you and you and Andreas in particular um, and, and Ellie helped to shape uh, 
really worked really, really well. And I'm really pleased with it. So again, um, I'm, I'm drying out. So I'll, I'll stop <laughs> with, again, sincere thanks to everybody. Um, I hope it was as worth your while as it was ours.